All right, here we go. Psalms for beginners. This is lesson number 11 entitled The Royal Psalms and this is the final class in our series. Well, we said that Psalms deals, uh, or the book of Psalms deals with uh, every experience in the human range and um, they are inspired poetry describing man's response, uh, man's praise, uh, his questions, laments, all these things before God as he lives out his human and frail life, always facing death, but with a hope beyond death. All these elements work their way into the various Psalms that we have looked at. They are the writings of men who through inspiration could see beyond this world into the other unseen world, and they expressed their human experiences in the larger context that included the reality of the spiritual perspective. So they, they cried out, uh, you know, they, they, they described their troubles and their needs and their hopes and their fears you know, in a very real context, uh, you know, real world context, but they were crying out to God. They were, they were speaking of a God who is outside of uh, human history uh, for uh, assistance. And this, of course, all done several thousands of years ago. Uh, most of the Psalms deal with the present how uh, they are affected, how the individuals who wrote the Psalms uh, were affected by adversity or sin, uh, their reaction to the beauty of creation uh, or God's word or His presence in the now of life. Uh, but the royal Psalms, the ones that we're going to talk about in this uh, last session here, uh, they are Psalms that deal with man's relationship with his um, earthly rulers um, also, uh, these, um, these uh, royal psalms have the distinction of being the psalms that go beyond the present and into the future. So mo you know, the psalms are talking to God and about God. He's outside of time, he's outside of history. The royal psalms not only are talking uh, to about God and about the king and about a present situation, but they're also the psalms that are prophetic, uh, prophetic in nature uh, that are looking forward. Uh, some of them looking forward only into the immediate future, others into the long term, uh, into the long term future um, when the Messiah would ultimately come. So royal psalms uh, are the prophetic psalms. Uh, royal or messianic psalms deal with the king as God's anointed or chosen one. Uh, many are prayers for the wisdom of the king or for his long life, or for his success uh, in battle. And many of these psalms are prophetic in nature in that they also point to the ideal future king, and as far as the Jews were concerned, the Messiah, or the King of Kings. In the Old Testament, the people understood the term Messiah in two different ways. First, he was the anointed one the one anointed by God. In the Old Testament we would see when God would appoint a king, he would send one of the prophets to anoint him you know, with some oil on his head. And so the one that God would choose would be called the anointed one. The term Christ, Jesus Christ, the term Christ means anointed one in the Greek language, which is the language of the New Testament. The term Christ, you know, Jesus Christ. Christ, that's not his last name, that's a, that's a title. Jesus, the anointed one. It was a term also used for a prophet or a priest or a king who was separated from among the people and given an office to fulfill a certain task. So the anointed one did not only refer to a king, but also could refer to a priest or a prophet someone who was chosen by God. And again, in the Old Testament, many times that choice was made you know, in a visible symbol, that individual was anointed with oil by a, a leader or a prophet. And then uh, in a more specific sense, the term Messiah referred to the ultimate ideal king, the savior, the Lord, who was to come and save the people uh, forever. The poets often were speaking about actual kings in these royal psalms when they referred to messiahs or anointed ones. And then the New Testament writers took these and applied them to Jesus as the Christ. So the interesting thing about not all, but some of the royal psalms is that they, 
they talk about the, the, the actual present king, you know, in, the, in the present, this is a, a royal psalm directed to a, an individual that they knew who was alive and existed at that time. Many times they also at the same time refer to something that is coming in the future, a short time into the future, and then a third meaning uh, eschatologically, meaning the end times, referring to someone who would come at the end times, the Messiah, the, the future uh, savior that would come. So a very interesting, intricate type of, uh, of uh, poetry. Uh, let's look at Psalm 2. Here uh, in Psalm 2, the author demonstrates how the king, as God's chosen one, can have confidence despite the plotting and the scheming of uh, his ungodly enemy. So let's begin reading verses, uh, chapter two, uh, Psalm 2, rather, verses 1 to 3. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. So here he's referring to the nations. The nations are the Gentiles and their rulers, the non-Jewish peoples and those kings. The author demonstrates that to conspire against the king is to conspire against the one who has made him king, who has anointed him as king, and that's God himself. Uh, same way today, to attack the messenger you know, in the church, to attack the messenger, the preacher, the elder, is to attack the one who sends the messenger and the message, which is Christ himself. Uh, in verses four to nine, he talks about a conspiracy against God's ordain and, and the two responses that God has to conspiracies against the one that he has uh, placed into uh, power. First, in verses four to six, we read, he who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And so how does God respond to you know, resistance against the holy one that he has appointed king? Well, first, God will scorn the plans of men against him as few, uh, foolish and futile. And secondly, he'll ultimately judge such things and punish the guilty and uphold and confirm the one whom he has chosen in the first place. So we keep reading in verse seven. He says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And so in the poem, uh, the king is confirmed this position uh, is confirmed, not just a king, uh, some sort of official, but as a son of God. God is anointing you, God is putting you there. And, and in those times, if you were the king of Israel, you were, you were considered uh, you know, God's son. And so many times anointed kings were seen as sons of God. Uh, the messianic reference to Jesus here, the son of God and the ruler of all, right? So uh, at the time it was written, uh, as far as the readers who were reading this at the time it was written, they were thinking, yes, if God anoints a king, that's his son. But in a long term you know, messianic prophecy, this is what God says about Jesus, his anointed one, the one that he has sent to save his people. In verse eight, it says, ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. So here God is saying to the king, to the anointed one, go ahead and ask me. I will bless you as a king. I'll give you, you know, I'll give you a victory over your enemies and so on and so forth. And then in verse nine, it says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. And so God will give victory to his anointed one over the kings, the other kings who are his enemies. That was in the present at the time that it was written. We could apply this to David, for example. You know, he was considered God's son. And God said, you know, I'll protect you against your enemies. And God said, as my anointed one, as my chosen one, you're going to rule everyone. If you take that same thing and move it forward 
as a messianic prophecy, Jesus is God's son, the anointed one, the chosen one to come and save the people. And God gave him victory uh, over the greatest enemy. The greatest enemy is what? Well, death, of course. In the same way, you know, David had to fight battles. He lost men, you know, he lost equipment. Sometimes the wars went on for a while, but ultimately he gained victory over his enemies. Well, in the same way, Jesus, you know, he had some setbacks. He was, you know, he was uh, rejected by the people. Obviously he was crucified. He was, he, was, uh, he was executed, but he had the final victory, didn't he? He resurrected from the dead, and in his resurrection from the dead, the church is established, and the church grows and continues to grow and continues to have, quote, victory. It outlasts the Roman Empire and all the different empires. It has continued on, uh, as Daniel uh, said in, in his book, the kingdom, you know, that stone will, you know, will, will grow and, and, and cover the uh, and cover the earth. So there you see in this psalm here uh, some parallels between how people interpreted the psalm when it was written and how the, uh, uh, the New Testament writers used this to show the fulfillment of prophecy concerning the Messiah. So let's keep reading verse 10 to 12. He says, Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage, uh, homage excuse me, to the Son, that He not become angry, and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. So here the rulers, you know, the enemy uh, rulers or rebels, are warned to repent and submit to God's anointed King. In the context, it is a warning by David to others not to trifle with Israel and her King, who although small was protected by um, the great Jehovah. Remember, when David became king, it wasn't like he was just the king in waiting and he waited in luxury and then one day when it was his turn, he was just anointed the king and he began to rule. If you read about his life, you find out that there was a tremendous, many years of struggle uh, against foreign nations, uh, against his own king, Saul, who was trying to kill him, who was chasing him down, and when Saul died, uh, even then it took time to consolidate the kingdom uh, uh, under him because there were factions, you know, different tribes that didn't want to give him a sovereignty over them. So he struggled before he became king. So this was a, a warning, not only to you know, uh, uh, those uh, uh, other nations around, but even within uh, the kingdom who opposed him. Be careful, you know, those of you who rebel against me, those of you who are against me, you know, eventually God is going to give me uh, the victory. So in, in, a, in a messianic context, this is also true, that rebellion against God and rebellion against His King, Jesus, will fail and will ultimately be punished, but submission will bring reward and protection. So the, 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 the psalm fits perfectly uh, as it talks about David, the king, and then if you project it forward as a messianic prophecy, it also fits perfectly uh, for uh, Jesus uh, the Messiah. All right, let's take a look at another royal psalm. This would be Psalm 45. Very different kind of, of psalm here, very different kind, very different tone. Um, uh, these psalms were written, or many times written, to uh, commemorate battles and great national events. And the marriage of the king was also one such event. And this particular psalm, Psalm 45, was written especially for a royal and joyous occasion, and that would be the um, wedding of the king. Uh, the psalm also provides a similar image of the beauty of the marriage between God and His nation, and in a messianic sense, Christ and His church. So here, the royal psalm is not talking simply about um, historical events how David became king against his enemies and he would rule and God protected him and people should you know, respond to him and, 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 and the same, you know, the same uh, imagery fits uh, you know, Jesus' ministry, life, death, burial, resurrection and how people respond to him, you know, uh, kind of events, history. This psalm actually is so fascinating. It talks about relationships and relationships in, in different 
context. For example, it talks about a historical relationship. The, the psalm was written about a historical event that was about to take place and that was the marriage of, Saul, uh, of Solomon and an Egyptian princess, a wedding. So it, it's talking about uh, an, uh, an event where a relationship is about to be produced. In a metaphorical sense, it is talking about the relationship between God and His people, God and His nation. And then on another level, in a messianic sense, it's talking about Christ and His church. So it's not simply about you know, now and in the short term future and in the long term future, it's talking about relationships, historical relationship, metaphorical relationship, and a messianic relationship. Very, very interesting. So in verse one, the um, author is going to simply introduce his topic, and that is praise for the king. He says, my heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So you know, there's the introduction. I am about to praise the king. I am uh, anxious to praise the king. So he begins verse two. He says, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. So he begins by simply praising the king. You, know, you are wise and you are blessed by God. You will be blessed by God. And that's, you know, by saying this is going to happen, this is a wish, this is a desire. My desire is that God continues to bless you forever. Verse uh, three uh, to five says, gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and your majesty, and in your majesty ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp, the peoples fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemy. So he's the defender of the righteous. He has power to defend the people, and people are expecting this uh, from him. Verses six and seven, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellow. So he's exalted on the throne by God. Notice that he talks about the king as the son of God, actually even refers to him as God. Well, you know, that's literature here, that's not theology. You know, some people say, wait a minute, well, that's not right theology. You know, Solomon wasn't God, he wasn't divine. Well, no, of course not. Did you ever hear of hyperbole? You know, exaggeration for the sake of praise. You know, you're like God you know, to the people, you know, the son of God. A little parallelism going on there at the same time. You know, we see this in other Psalms or in other places in the Bible where someone will address the king, you know, subordinate will address the king and before they speak they say, O king, may you live forever and then say what they want to say. Well, may you live forever. Is the king going to live forever? Well, no. You know, Solomon died, David died, Saul died. But it's, 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 it's an exaggerated praise, a way of speaking, a way of addressing someone in high office. And so here he's saying, your throne, you know, your, your throne has been set up by God. You're like a God to the people around you. Verse eight and nine, he says, all your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Out of ivory palaces, stringed instruments have made you glad. King's daughters are among your noble ladies. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. So um, he's blessed, he's honored, he's joyful. You know, this is the condition of the king. Um, when it was written, it talked about a man, but it can only properly be ascribed to Jesus. You know, if, you, if you're reading all of this, okay, uh, then, uh, <laughs> and you apply it to Jesus, then it's no longer hyperbole. It's no longer exaggeration. It fits perfectly. Everything he says here can be applied to Jesus and it fits 
not just, you know, uh, it fits theologically, let's put it this way. It's not exaggeration, it fits theologically. Let's keep reading verses uh, 10 to 15. The author is going to now begin to describe the queen. So in verses 10 to 12 he says, listen, O daughter, give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord, bow down to him. The daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. So she's a foreign princess. Uh, we know that she was a, from Egypt. She was an Egyptian princess, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. And the fact, uh, and the poet rather, entreats her to forget her past and her home and to give herself totally to her king and her new husband. So it's an exhortation uh, to the new queen. We continue. He says, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. She will be led to the king in embroidered work. The virgins, her companions who follow her, will be brought to you. They will be led forth with gladness and rejoicing. They will enter into the king's palace. So he describes her maidens and her beauty, the beauty of her wedding garments and her joy at being the bride of the king. Here, the images of the church and Christ. You know, if, we, if we look at this uh, and we apply it to the church and Christ, fits perfectly. That the church should forget the past and give herself totally to her husband, Jesus, submit to him, perfect. That the church is beautiful without spot or wrinkle, purified in the blood of Christ made ready to be wed to the king. See the imagery there that fits. And also uh, the imagery um, of God and His people. Same, same idea. Fits every which way. So the poem is written for an actual historical situation between two actual historical individuals, but can be also perfectly applied to God as a, as a a poem of praise and description of the relationship between God and His people, and then further down the line in Messianic prophecy between Christ and His church, which is kind of the same as God and His people. But if you were a Jew reading this, you would understand, wow, this, this fits perfectly in the description of God and His people, the people of Israel. Today we, we say, this fits perfectly uh, to, to, to describe the relationship between Jesus, who is God, and His people, the church. So 13 to 15, let's read um, uh, 16 and 17. He says, in place of your fathers uh, will be your sons. You shall make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the peoples will give you thanks forever and ever. So the poet looks now into the future and he sees the line of the king being propagated with future kings through this particular union. In other words, you know, you'll have sons, they'll be princes, eventually they'll be kings and their sons will be kings and so on and so forth. Again, it fits well. Uh, the present context, you know, the king marrying this bride, and also a prophetic look at the union between Christ, the king, and church, and the church, which is the bride of Christ. A couple of comparisons here. He is wise and blessed. Also the defender, <clears throat> excuse me, the defender of righteousness and exalted through the resurrection to the right hand of God. We're talking about Jesus. And his union with the church produces what? A future royal heritage who will also reign with Christ in heaven. So the matches, you know, it matches Solomon and the, the Egyptian queen. It, it also speaks to and describes the relationship between the Messiah and his church. It fits the historical context, but also fits a higher and more noble and more sublime uh, imagery, beautiful, you know, perfect fit. Solomon and his bride, God and the nation of Israel, Christ and his church. Okay, let's look at another royal psalm, one other one. Uh, tried to pick some that are very, you know, they're royal psalms, but they're very different from uh, one another. This time, Psalm 110, Psalm 110 the psalm about the priest 
king, the priest king relationship. So this Psalm here, 110, is the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. It's important to note that while many statements could refer to David, many of the statements in this Psalm can only refer to Christ, who is the ideal king and Messiah. Now the previous Psalms, we said they fit perfectly, you know, Solomon or David and Christ or the church, you know, they, they're mix and match, you know, they fit perfectly. But in this Psalm, there's some things that are said you know, in the context of history and David as the king, but can only really fit perfectly the Messiah. Okay? So when it was written, it was seen as an ideal to which the king could aspire. The psalm is divided into two sections, both of them beginning with a divine utterance. Let me explain to you. Verse, uh, begin in verse one to three. The Lord says to my Lord. There's the divine utterance. In other words, the poet is not putting words in God's mouth, but he begins with God speaking. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. So, begins historically, the king's rule is such by divine authority. You know, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. You know, God is the one has given you your position, sit at my right hand, has anointed you as king. The throne will be in Zion and will rule its enemies. Well, where was David? He was in Jerusalem. He ruled over his enemies. A little bit like the first Psalm that we read, right? And then when he rules people, especially young, strong men, excuse me, I should, there should be a comma there. When he rules, comma, people, especially young, strong men, will fill his army. And here's the imagery. Just as the dawn brings with it the dew that covers everything, when the king reigns, his soldiers will cover, will cover the land. Now in Matthew 22 verses 41 to 45, we read this again. It says, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. So here in Matthew, Jesus gives the actual prophetic and messianic meaning to this passage by explaining that David wasn't only referring to himself here, you know, the Lord God said to him, David, you know, Lord, sit at my right hand. David wasn't only referring to himself here, but also to the future divine Messiah who was to come and whose rulership and army was to be similar, but vastly greater. So in messianic terms, the Lord God said to my Lord, Jesus, sit at right, my right hand. I'll give you victory, so on and so forth. In verses four to seven, the same king is also anointed as a priest. Very interesting, let's go back to the psalm in verse four. It says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So right here, you know, we leave the script. So far, historically, this royal psalm could be you know, applied to David, but from here on in, you can't, David may have written it, but it can't be applied to David, all right? So the same king is also anointed as a priest, according to this, but not a priest of the type uh, uh, that Aaron the priest was, from a particular line, you know, tribe of Levi, Aaron. He was temporal, he was limited. He sacrificed only for the Jewish people. That was his kind of priest. That was the kind of priest that the Jews had. He says, according to the order of Melchizedek, you know, Melchizedek, who was a type 
that represented other things. We know who Melchizedek was when uh, Abraham uh, won the victory against the kings, rescuing his nephew after the battle was over. This character, this individual Melchizedek, a priest of God, just turns up in the text and offers uh, you know, them uh, food and blesses them. And, and, and Abraham pays a, th a, th a tithe, if you wish, to Melchizedek. This Melchizedek is the one that David is referring to. And he's saying, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, what's the order of Melchizedek? What's the point? Well, Melchizedek, the type of priest he was, the, the preview, okay, was that he was a priest who was universal. In other words, he didn't only minister to Jews. You know, Melchizedek was a Gentile, a Gentile priest who ministered to Abraham, who was, well, the father of the Jews. So universal means he wasn't limited to one group. He could, he could minister as a priest, he could minister to everyone. That's the type of priest we're talking about here, according to the order of Melchizedek. And also a priesthood without end, meaning he appeared and he disappeared without any genealogy or ending. Now, it doesn't mean that Melchizedek, historically that character, was like an eternal being, a divine being. Now he was a human being, but in the Old Testament, whenever a character is introduced, Usually they say, this is so-and-so, who's the son of so-and-so from the tribe of so-and-so to kind of put that person into a social and historical context. Even Gentiles, when they mention them, they mention he was the son of the king or he was of this particular tribe over here or at least of this particular people. They don't give that with Melchizedek. He simply appears this one time and then never again and nothing is known about his lineage, his history, where he was born, where he died, we don't know. And so that gives us the type. He not only is able to minister to everyone, he also has no end. So in this Psalm, Psalm 10, right, we see only a future application possible. Remember I said, it starts off, you can apply it to David and you could also apply it to Christ. You know, the Lord said to my Lord. You know. But this section here can only, cannot be applied to David because kings did not serve as priests. And who could claim universality and eternity but a divine being? So yes, David wrote it under inspiration, but it wasn't referring to him. It was referring to some, someone in the future. And we say the only person who could fulfill this prophecy is Jesus, because only He is a priest appointed by God, able to minister to everyone in the world and do so forever. So the combination of priest and king anointed by God will establish sovereignty and rulership over all the nations. Let's look at five to seven. He says, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Um, so here, I, I'll just repeat my comment. With this passage, David says, this particular individual, a combination of priest and king, anointed by God, this person will establish sovereignty and rulership over all the nations. His kingdom, his priesthood will be over all the nations. And at the end it says, therefore he will lift up his head. Lifting up your head uh, in, in, in Hebrew poetry meant will have the victory. The one who lifts up his head, it's as if, you know, yeah, you know, lift up your head that individual will have victory. So he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the priest, he's our high priest, offered himself on the cross, right? And he's king, he's the Lord, Lord over everyone, ministers to everyone, Lord over everyone. His kingdom will rule over everything. What does Jesus say? Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, nothing will destroy this kingdom. 
It'll be there forever. When Jesus comes, everything will be destroyed, except what? Well, except the church. So this is a prophecy, a messianic prophecy looking forward to the individual who will come as the Messiah. And what David is doing here is he is describing for the people of his time, you know, not everything, but he is, he is giving an idea of who and what the Messiah will be. Very, you know, 700 years or so before Christ. So historically, historically the king through an enlightened priesthood saw the nation as the universal light of the world. And this psalm would call them to this. In other words, the Jewish nation. They're supposed to be the light of the world. The king has been anointed by God. The priests have been anointed by God. They each have their work to do. And together, along with the nation, they are to be the light of the world, the light of the Gentiles. So this poem is referring to that idea historically during David's reign. What the king and the priesthood, what they ought to be and what the nation ought to be in God's service to the world. In the, and, it, and it goes into the future. In the future, the king and the, uh, the priest will be combined in one person. And that person is Jesus Christ. So historically, the king through the enlightened priesthood saw the nation as the universal light of the world, and this psalm would call them to this. Prophetically, it refers to the perfect balance of Jesus' dual roles as king and priest offering himself on behalf of the people. Uh, all the psalms are beautiful, of course. They're inspired by God. They're meaningful in so many ways, but I have to say my, my favorites are the royal psalms because they're so beautifully described the image of Christ, the beauty of Christ, and also uh, in their own way uh, begin to talk about the coming of the Messiah and the things that He would do to give people hope uh, for the future. Well, that's the end of our uh, uh, Psalms for Beginners this series. I hope it's uh, been a blessing to you, giving you a little bit of information about the Psalms, and hopefully with this kind of technical information, as you read them, they'll be much more meaningful for you and you'll hopefully get more out of them. So thank you very much and God bless you.